from my geological perspective, and I, I think you know one of the things I learned um, dealing with both geologists and, and biologists uh, is that they think very differently in time frames. And one of the things that as geologists we do, we spend a lot of time to just getting into our head this concept of the enormity of time that that geolo that that has been present on our planet history. And even in ecology, we do pretty good at understanding things 500 years ago or 100 years ago. But you know, when you really get back to thinking in a million or billion years, it begins to get a bit complicated. And we tend to think in terms of, oh, yeah, our planet is always the same. And we can see this playing out in the political landscape. And you'll find people saying, oh, yeah, well, CO2 has been high in the past, so who cares? We don't care. It's big, no big deal. Because it was higher in the past, and now it's OK. So if it's higher, if we make it higher, it'll be OK. Well, you know, I've got a colleague who was in a plane crash, and both of his legs were amputated. And he can still walk on his you know, new legs, but it's not OK. It's not the same. Okay? And likewise, what I want you to think about with you know, planet Earth, and one of the bottom lines of this lecture is for most of the history of planet Earth, has not been habitable for us as human beings. It is not even if you're a trilobite, OK? It has not been habitable for animals for most of Earth history. And so to make the statement that, well, because it was OK once, because we had those conditions once in the past, means that any of those conditions we shouldn't worry about is, is, is a fallacy. So um, I just want to think about this from the geological perspective. And the one way I can think about it is let's just think about distance and time. Okay? And just think about the landscapes. You know, if you're going to only look at one little tiny part of a landscape, how representative of it is of the distance? And so I'm going to choose this distance from Miami, Florida to Seattle. Okay? And that in kilometers is the same as the age of the Earth in millions of years. So right now, we're looking at a very short millions of years. And how many years? I've looked at the Earth now for 67 years. That's my window of time that I'm looking at the Earth. And uh, that would actually be equivalent to 67 millimeters of the distance between Miami and Seattle. So you could take some 67 millimeters, so, you know, whatever it is, that long, you know, that little piece of distance, how representative of that is it of the whole journey? Not very representative. Okay? So the time that humans have, our genus has been on the planet is basically the equivalent of the distance from right here to your hotel. Okay, that distance, that doesn't actually encounter any mountains. It doesn't encounter any oceans. It doesn't encounter uh, any rivers. Uh, it's not particularly representative of that whole distance. And again, your lifetime on the planet, you know, basically represents, you could go out and, okay, go to a blade of grass about, okay, that's your distance that you would get to see, okay? So our particular window of time is not particularly representative. And let's think about this in the context. Well, how do we know how old our Earth is? Okay. Well, we date it. And we use isotopes. Okay. Isotopes, some are radioactive, and they're our friends, and they give us a clock. Okay. That's what we love in isotopes for in geology, is there a clock. And for those of you who are postdocs and you think you're working on a tough, cool problem and you're doing okay, or graduate students or undergraduates, consider this. Uh, Arthur Holmes, in his undergraduate thesis, okay, measured the age of the Earth in 1912. <laughs> okay? And he was a bit off, but at the time there's a huge debate as exactly how old the Earth was. And he uh, certainly was within, a, he was within a factor of two, which is you know, absolutely stunning. But he 
actually for his undergraduate thesis, uh, tried to develop an actual clock for dating the Earth, and he was the first person, to, first, first, first person to do it as an undergraduate, and became one of the greatest uh, geologists um, ever. Uh, okay, a couple of the isotopes that we use are rubidium strontium. Okay, and there's some undergraduates that are sitting here in the front row, and they're working with Diego Fernandez in the geology department. And one of the things Diego loves to do is measure strontium isotopes. And I think he measures actually about 1,000 or 2,000 strontium <coughs> isotope measurements a year, probably more than any other person. The okay, the notion is there uh, that we can have radioactive decay of 87 rubidium turning into strontium 87. Okay, this has a half-life of 49 billion years. Okay, longer than, so this is 10 times longer than the lifetime of our planet. Okay, so since our planet formed, only 10% of the rubidium 87 has undergone decay, but it's enough to give us a clock. And we can actually use it to, 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 to rocks that crystallized uh, only 10 or 20,000 years ago because of the precision of things we can measure. We also use uh, lead isotopes, okay, which we also measure over in the geology department. And our hero undergraduates here are working again with Diego, who uh, does wonders uh, in that isotope space. So what we think now is the age of our Earth is 4.567 billion years old. That's our age estimate. <clears throat> and what we actually date that we can directly date of this age are meteorites that we think are the collective stuff in our planet, okay? And there's a number of meteorites that we can do. A famous one is one called the Allende meteorite, which uh, fell about, I think it fell in 1967. And what's really cool about it for an isotope geochemist is it actually something, we say it contains extinct Aluminum 26. So in, you know, we're buying extinction from the biological community. It's something that there's no longer natural stuff around. Okay, like the dodo bird is extinct. It's gone. Well, aluminum 26 has a half-life of 0 0.7 million years. Okay, so this is one of those elements that's made in supernova. So if we can find something that is evidence that aluminum 26 was present, then it, it, when, when that stuff formed, um, then it must have been within maybe 10 lifetimes of nucleosynthesis. So this Allende meteorite <coughs> is one which has extinct aluminum 26. Aluminum, uh, aluminum 26, where is it? Aluminum 26 decays to magnesium 26, okay? And so here's an example of something. These are both stable isotopes. All right, so these different minerals have different amounts of magnesium in them, and, or different amounts of aluminum in them. This is, there's almost no aluminum in this, and, but if it has aluminum 26, it builds up magnesium, and so we get this high excess magnesium 26. So one of the things we can do is, is measure these extinct isotopes. So nucleosynthesis, meteorite formation, planetary accretion, all within 10 million years. So this meteorite had to form within 10 million years of nucleosynthesis, okay? And it's basically the age of what the asteroids are. Okay, the first half billion years of our planet with a pretty tough place. And remember these short-lived um, these short-lived stars that make a lot of the elements only have a lifetime of five or 10 million years, okay? so. Uh, we were, right now, I mean, the place where we are, the habitable zone is kind of called the Goldilocks zone, okay? We're right distance to be with liquid water. Well, okay, uh, about uh, 100 million years after nucleosynthesis, so longer than the life of most of these stars, something about the size of Mars hit Earth, okay? And the result of that was Earth plus Moon, okay? So... Um, these short-lived stars 
uh, have a lot of this kind of stuff happening. Okay, this happened and the planets nearby have this kind of stuff happening. Tough place for life. Okay, so we definitely can't be uh, in, 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 life is not going to exist while that kind of activity is going on. Um, another interesting thing that we can use isotopes for is uh, this is the isotope ratio oxygen 17 to oxygen 18. Okay, oxygen 17 is the rare isotope that um, most of you guys haven't thought about, but uh, Naomi Levin is going to be giving a lecture uh, next week on what you can do if you look at oxygen 17 and look at the teensy little tiny little bit of space distributed about this line, okay? Not this gigantic space of these. But if we look at the different, uh, uh, different meteorites, we got samples from Earth and Moon we can look at. There are meteorites which have been blasted off, they're, they're fragments of Mars which have been blasted off and fallen into Earth. There's other stuff that has been blasted off of Vesta, which is a large asteroid, and they've landed on Earth. Okay, and uh, they have different oxygen 17 to 18 ratios. Okay, and if we look at this detail right here, and we look at the detail distributed about this line, uh, we'll see some interesting things. But uh, this kind of thing severely impacted the early history of our planet. One of the big problems uh, 40 years ago was how come the argon in our atmosphere is not what it should be theoretically, and it turns out if we have this happening, this will blow away the atmosphere, and we have to start all over. Our atmosphere has way, way more argon-40 than it should. Argon-40 comes from potassium-40, so we think all of the early atmosphere with its argon-36 got blown away in this kind of an event, 